Hello and welcome back. So today I want to talk about noise. Power supply related noise. Haven't done that in a while. In particular, I want to continue working on my effects circuit by providing an alternative to battery power. Now I did make the possibility to supply it with a DC adapter and in the meantime I did get a DC adapter. So this is not dedicated audio adapter thingy, it's just a random transformer that you can buy. It's quite nice that it has a variable output so you can set it to 9 volts or something else. But it also has a not so nice feature. Let me show you what I mean. So if I connect my guitar to the effect and for example we play a few notes, we see that it works, the signal is passing through it, everything is nice. But now if I take my DC adapter and plug this thing into the effect, so it goes from battery power to external power. Well, it works. I mean, signal still passes through everything, but there's something wrong about it. It's very annoying. There's a ton of noise coming from the DC adapter. So today, what I wanna do is look at why this phenomenon is happening, why the DC adapter is so noisy, and rather than try to fix it, just make a better one, and also discuss some other power supply related topics. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So let's start off by looking at the noise in a bit more detail. So what I got here is my DC adapter and I'll be connecting my oscilloscope probe directly to its output just to see the noise level. So we can see that even with no load attached to it, there are a lot of these high frequency spikes, but there's also a nice sawtooth wave in there. And if we check this with the cursors, we can see that based on the time difference between two of these spikes, we have a nice frequency of 1.08 kilohertz, right there in the middle of the audio spectrum. Now, it's worth mentioning that this supply is a switching supply, so we are expecting some switching noise, but not at 1 kilohertz. I mean, this thing works at around 50, 60 kilohertz, something like that, so where is this coming from? And to get a better idea of what's going on, I'll be using my magnetic field probe just to see when the supply is switching and when this noise is happening. So, if we look at what our magnetic field probe picked up, we can see that it is picking up noise, but only when the voltage starts to drop. I may be measuring this thing in reverse. So now we can clearly see that when there is switching action going on, the voltage rises and then it drops off no switching going on, and when it reaches a certain threshold, again the supply switches. So the supply is switching at a high frequency, it just takes a break from time to time. Problem being that if it would continue switching all the time, the voltage would just shoot up and exceed the required output voltage. Basically, the supply is working in bursts, hence the term burst mode operation. So to get it to switch continuously, we would need to provide it a minimum load. So something that would use up all the energy that's being pushed through the transformer so that it doesn't have to take a break from time to time. Let's see what load would be needed. So now I added my active load and we can start to increase the current. We can immediately see that the noise situation is getting worse and worse. And eventually now well, the waveform is changing and finally at 750 milliamps the power supply is running continuously no more burst mode now 700 milliamps at 9 volts is around 6 7 watts that's a lot i mean for an audio effect that's huge so I can't really use that much power to get the supply working correctly. So the easiest thing to do, other than buy a better power supply, is make a better power supply. So I'll be using some old school methods, transformers and linear regulators. 
let's get to this thing. So this is the basic schematic that I came up with. So I have my input to mains connection, a fuse, it's always important to have a fuse, iron core transformer, taking the 220 volt AC that is present in my country to down to 9 volts, rectifying bridge, some filtration, linear regulator, more filtration, and then an output. Now, there are a few details I do want to mention about the schematic, and we'll go through them one by one. So first of all, the regulator. For this project, I have chosen the LD1085, which is a linear regulator, handles up to 3 amps, but the characteristic that I wanted from this regulator was its low dropout feature. In other words, this regulator, based on its spin-out and how it works, is almost identical to the LM317 that everybody's heard about. But the low dropout feature refers to this input to output voltage difference. So when the circuit is working correctly, what is the minimum voltage difference that needs to exist between the output and the input? Which for the LM317 is 3 volts. So if I want to output 9 volts from an LM317, I need to supply it with a minimum of 12 volts. Whereas for the LD 1085, this dropout is maximum of 1.5. So to get 9 volts, I only need to supply it with 10.5. So we can make it a bit more power efficient. Now, being an LDO type of regulator, it comes with a few drawbacks. And one of the things we need to watch out for is the output capacitor. Now, for a regular linear regulator, you don't really care, you need to add a capacitor and whatever you put is perfectly fine. But if you look closely, into the datasheet of an LDO type of regulator, you will probably find this sort of graph that shows you what sort of capacitor and what ESR is needed for correct functionality. So we have this stability graph. Everything inside the hashed area is stable operation, everything outside will lead to oscillations. So we need to ensure a minimum capacity of around 90 nanofarads, that's not hard to obtain, but we also need to take care of the ESR. So we can't have more than 25 ohms, again, not something difficult to achieve, but we can't have anything lower than 80 milliohms. So for example, if you would put large ceramic capacitors, you could make this thing unstable. So for that reason, I will be using a regular aluminum electrolytic, which has a lot of ESR, and also a tantalum 22 microfarad capacitor, which again will have enough ESR so that we can achieve this stability criteria. Now, another feature worth mentioning about the LDO is this minimum load current requirement. So just like with the switching regulator, we have a minimum load to get everything to work correctly, which in this case is around three milliamps. Now, depending on what resistors you're using to set the output voltage, so this is the typical schematic, depending on the values of the resistors, you might already achieve this minimum load requirement from these resistors, but if not, you need to add an extra resistor to maintain the minimum load. In my case, I added this extra resistor just to make sure that there's no stability issues. Now about the schematic, there are a few more features I want to mention. So first of all, I added this common mode choke on the input, not really sure if it's necessary, but I put it there so that I can take it out. It's easier this way than to never put it in and then need it. The whole point of this was to make a very, very low noise supply, not just for my audio effect, but if I ever need a low noise supply so that I can use this. And this column mode choke should help with any sort of high frequency noise that exists either in the main supply or in the circuit that I'm supplying so that it interrupts the circuit. Another feature that's worth mentioning is the rectifying bridge. So even though it looks a bit weird, this is a rectifying bridge. And as diodes, I chose to go with Schottky type diodes rather than the regular PN junction type of diode. Now, one of the issues with the regular type of rectifying diode is this reverse recovery time. So the time it takes the diode to stop conducting when reverse voltage is applied. And for PN type of diodes, for example, the 1N4000 series, this is in the order of tens of microseconds, which is quite a lot. On the other hand, with a Schottky type of diode, this value is much, much lower. 
so it's in the order of nanoseconds. The reason why this is important is that with rectifying bridges built with normal type of diodes, you will get a certain buzzing effect going on. So it's quite common in old schematics to have some capacitors in parallel with the diode to reduce this effect. But it's easier to simply put Schottky diodes and be done with it. So that's why here in the schematic I also left room for some normal capacitors in case the different type of diode is used. And also another advantage of the Schottky diode is the voltage drop, which is lower than for the normal type of diode. Instead of being 0.7 volts, for this sort of diode it's 0.3, 0.4, depending on the diode of course. Point is, I wanted to keep the circuit as efficient as possible, so not to waste power where you don't need it. Final thing to mention is that my transformer output is 9 volts AC, but 9 volts AC is 9 volts RMS, meaning that the peak voltage is around 12.7 volts, so even after rectification and the 1.5 volt drop on the regulator, I still have enough voltage to obtain my 9 volts output. So let's see if the circuit actually works and just how noisy it is. So this is how the circuit came out. This is the little board on which everything is mounted. So most of the components are surface mount other than the large electrolytics, the regulator and the transformer and fuse. And I've designed it so that everything fits inside this nice little box. So this is a standard case that already has an adapter so that you can plug it into the main supply. And I also added these spacers so that the PCB stands nicely on top of it. Now I would just like to point out I left this gap here in the layout so that the low voltage part is always separated by quite some distance from the high voltage part, so from the mains there's no risk of an electric arc occurring. And I also want to mention that while I will be making my measurements with the box open and the PCB exposed, I want to use an isolation transformer. So a transformer that has a one-to-one -one ratio, but it allows me to stay galvanically isolated from the mains, and if for whatever reason I accidentally touch one of the live wires, I don't get electrocuted, regardless of which wire it is. So let's try this thing out. Let's start off by measuring voltage and current capabilities. So I got this setup. I'm supplying my circuit from my isolation transformer. The values don't really mean anything. And I've connected the output to my active load through an amp meter. So we can see using the voltmeter what happens with the output voltage when I increase the current. So we can see that we have a nice stable output voltage. And if I start to increase the current at around 600 milliamps, the output voltage starts to drop. So if we check what's directly at the output of the rectifier, we can see that we have our minimum 10.5 volts at around 580 milliamps. After this, the voltage drops too much and the LDO regulator is not capable of providing the necessary 9 volts. Now the exact reason why the voltage is dropping can be down to the way in which I'm supplying the circuit. So because of my isolation transformer, I don't have enough voltage to supply the circuit. But we can recheck this when everything is plugged into the main supply. Now, it's time for the more important question, just how noisy the circuit actually is. And for that, I've connected my oscilloscope probe directly to the output of the power supply. And we can barely see anything, so it's mostly background noise in there. And if I increase the output current at around 500 milliamps, we almost see that there's a sine wave in there. But just to see exactly what's going on, it's finally time to make use of the low noise amplifier that I made a few videos back. I haven't used it since, but this is finally something that's actually useful for. So by using this thing, we can see that we have roughly 150 microvolts of output noise. This thing is providing a gain of a thousand. So whatever we see here, we need to divide by a thousand. And if we crank up the current a bit, we see this sine wave appearing, which is at 100 Hz. So this is the supply voltage that's rectified. So these are the peaks of the 50 Hz AC being rectified. Now there's one more thing we can check regarding this noise to see if it's coming from bad circuitry or from something else. 
and we can do that using the magnetic field probe. So if I bring my probe close to the transformer, like so, we can see that we have all these spikes in emissions, so we have peak currents happening when the diodes are conducting, and our voltage noise is at the same time happening as these spikes. So we could say that part of the noise is from the circuitry, part is from the magnetic emissions from the transformer. Now this particular transformer is of E plus I type of core, rather than a toroid type of core. The difference between the two constructions is regarding the way the magnetic field is contained inside of the transformer. With this transformer, part of the field is escaping, so we can measure it using the magnetic field probe, and if your measuring equipment is sensitive enough, you will pick it up also in the output of the supply. If I would have used a toroid type of core, we shouldn't be able to see any of these. Now the final thing I want to mention regarding the schematic is the use of capacitor C5 and diode D5. So these two components do not appear in the standard application circuit from the LD10085 circuit, but they do appear in the typical application of the LM317. And here it's clearly stated that the purpose of this capacitor is to reduce noise, and the purpose of the diode is to discharge the capacitor when you turn the supply off. So if you want to put this capacitor in, you also need a diode. Now in this datasheet, they're stating that the use of that capacitor will reduce the output noise, and I can also confirm that on my circuit, by adding the capacitor, I went from a peak-to-peak -peak noise of around 460 microvolts down to 156. So this has no influence on the magnetic field stuff, so the ripple caused by the transformer. This just helps with reducing the overall general noise of the circuit. So all in all, the circuit seems to be working quite nicely. So now the final test is to see how this thing works with the effect circuit. So I'll first turn on the effect with the batteries inside and it works. Now it's time to plug in the adapter and when we connect this thing to the effect, it seems to be quiet. So the adapter works. I tried it out also with some headphones and I can't hear a thing, so it's doing its job. And to be fair, it's worth mentioning that this sort of iron core transformer adapters are no longer really available commercially, partly because of manufacturing costs, but also because of modern day no load requirements. So after the 2000s, one of the laws that came into being was that any sort of adapter brick that you plug in needs to have a no load current consumption, so when it's not plugged into anything else, of a maximum few hundred milliwatts. This is to prevent useless energy waste. And this sort of transformer circuit does have a bit of power waste. So my particular circuit uses almost one watt when it's not plugged into anything. So it wouldn't pass the legal requirements. Also you can get low noise switching adapters and you can make them, but that's really complicated and difficult to do. But this sort of linear supply is much much easier to make for a hobby electronics enthusiast. So that will be all for today. Next time I promise I'll be making an effect. But for now, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.